Good afternoon to participants from uh, Asia. And uh, I'm Anita Prakash. I'm the Senior Policy Advisor in the Office of the President of Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia, IRIA, based in Jakarta. And I will moderate today's webinar. With me, we also have the co-hosts from Leiden Asia Center, Dr. Lily Sprangels, manager of the center and for all the research conducted there. And I have uh, the honor to present our another co-host, the very eminent Irma Mosvara Valderama. Friends just call her Irma. She is the full professor of tax governance and the PhD Dean at Leiden Law School. Uh, we will come back to our co-hosts later again as they speak towards the end. Friends, the Asia-Europe meeting or ASEM for short is a unique uh, cooperation initiative. Uh, it brings in scope for uh, transnational cooperation between member countries through regional and sub-regional activities. Since its uh, inception in 1996, ISM has played a key role as a forum for dialogue and cooperation between Asia and Europe. ISM is a collective effort towards addressing the demands of greater connectivity among the geographies, economies, and the people of Asia and Europe. ISM is wide enough to accommodate global, global and um, intercontinental developmental priorities. And yet it uh, localizes uh, connectivity amongst member countries and uh, uh, member blocks for partnership for economic growth, trade and investment, quality infrastructure, skill development, education, sustainable development, climate change, and so on and so forth. In the backdrop of the COVID-19 pandemic, both in Europe and Asia, the hosting of 13th ASM in Cambodia uh, assumed uh, greater significance as it uh, envisaged an inclusive and prosperous uh, growth pathways for the Asia-Europe region through multilateral cooperation and sustainable development. The 13th ASM had a mission to set out the future pathways for ASM. Now, uh, ASM has promoted uh, Asia's integration with Europe through physical, institutional, and social connectivity in which multilateralism and inclusive growth plays an important role. The ASM 13 plenary study uh, covered these themes in great detail. Today's webinar is special because of two reasons. One, it focuses on the forward-looking theme of digital connectivity and inclusive digital societies. The future of Asia and Europe is closely linked with this theme. The future of growth in Asia and Europe is closely linked with this theme. Friends, we are, uh, we are very honored uh, uh, to have amongst us four eminent speakers today who have written extensively on human resource mobility, a key uh, construct of uh, digital uh, society uh, legislative and regulatory cooperation for digital economy, financial cooperation, and finally, the structural nature of cooperation for uh, inclusive digital society and inclusive digital economy. These works are especially important given the different levels of development in different parts of Asia and Europe. Um, many of us who are present here today are aware that 13th ASM was delayed and finally held in 2021 under the long shadows of COVID-19. Now the shadow of war is again over the ASM meet, which is why it is uh, important for us to celebrate the regional initiatives such as EU ASEAN partnership, which is celebrating 45th year uh, of its partnership as the leaders meet in Brussels now. The Leiden Asia Center, the Global Tax Gov and EU Initiative and the Economic Research Institute for ASEAN and East Asia, Jakarta, have joined hands together today to organize this webinar to keep Asia-Europe cooperation in momentum. We hope that uh, our webinar today will contribute uh, to the partnership and to the longevity of ASEM process. 
So without any further ado, let me call upon the speakers. The order of uh, speakers will be the same as published in the program. Our first speaker today is Dr. Flavia. She has written extensively on labor mobility, especially in the context of ASM. With the arrival of concepts like nomad visa, her research has important bearing on inclusive digital society. Flavia is the head of policy and government affairs at uh, digital consultancy from Z uh, uh, consultancy firm ZIMT. Previously, uh, she worked as a senior researcher and lecturer at the University of Geneva's Global Studies Institute. And she also worked at the University of Lucerne. Her main research focus is on global trade regulations, business mobility, and international migration governance. For the 13th Asia Europe meeting uh, plenary study, she wrote on Asia Europe cooperation on labor mobility, education, and training. Flavia also wrote on the comparative picture of EU and ASEAN labor mobility frameworks at the time of the 11th ASM. Flavia, I give the floor to you and to tell us more how your work is important for inclusive digital societies uh, in Asia and Europe in the context of ASEAN. Thank you. Flavia. Thanks very much, Anita. Thanks for the introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here today and to share with you some of the um, insights from my work, as, as Anita said, on um, Europe-Asia cooperation in terms of um, labor, migration, mobility of people, of students, training and education, and mm -hmm. bring in this di dimension of digital transformations and how um, they impact mobility uh, mobility of um, of people. So today I'm going to address in the the, the overarching uh, theme of our um, of our webinar uh, in which ways can Asia and Europe cooperate in in creating inclusive digital societies and and what forms of cooperation are there therein. And as I said, my contribution would, would really focus on the frameworks of labor mobility, migration, education, and training cooperation in Europe and Asia in general. And in particular, I'll focus my discussion on EU and ASEAN cooperation. And then in the second part of the presentation, discuss how digitalization impacts human mobility. What are the opportunities? What are the challenges? And then end my, uh, my contribution with a few points on uh, areas where future cooperation between Europe, the EU in particular, and, and Asia, ASEAN, um, could move forward. And so let me start by presenting some of the key regulatory frameworks in place uh, across ASEAN and the EU. Um, and well, part of the ASEAN uh, regional uh, integration uh, framework, Mobility of people or, or labor mobility has not been part of the funding treaties, but nonetheless, uh, in, in regard with um, uh, trade, with exchanges in, uh, in services, we have the 1995 ASEAN Framework Agreement on Services, which part of the so-called God's Mode 4, mobility of service providers or of natural persons, labor mobility entered the discussion of the regional agenda across ASEAN. Um, now, commitments from the framework agreement of services have been then transposed into what is called today the Agreement of Movement of Natural Persons, adopted in uh, 2012 by, by ASEAN leaders. And in what, in essence, uh, they, they refer to these commitments basically address mobility of skilled uh, uh, labor linked to trading services uh, in the form of mainly intracorporate transferees, so mobility across um, companies, uh, mobility of labor across companies, also business visitors to establish a, a business in another location within the ASEAN region, but also um, contractual service suppliers that are sometimes delinked from commercial presence. So in this case, we talk about temporary mobility of skilled labor where um, domestic regulations might still apply, meaning that uh, particular uh, migration labor mobility uh, rules 
from the respective host country would still apply for, for, for this type of mobility. Another dimension of mobility within ASEAN is um, under the framework of the mutual recognition agreements. And um, in this area, we again talk about skilled migration in different uh, professions identified by the ASEAN states as key for the economy. And they range from engineering, accountancy to tourism, for example. Again, it's about temporary mobility. Um, Again, domestic regulation might still apply, but the overall goal is to facilitate labor mobility across the member states of um, the ASEAN uh, region. When it comes to uh, rights of the migrants um, and their families. Um, in 2018, we have uh, the ASEAN consensus on the protection and promotion of the rights of uh, migrant workers, which brings further developments uh, for enhancing mobility and also addressing perhaps parts of the lower skilled migration. So trying to accommodate the needs of, of lower skilled migrants, protect their rights uh, and yes, create a framework where mo mobility can further develop. Not least mobility also covers student higher education mobility. Um, and within ASEAN, there are ongoing efforts to achieve greater student mobility um, with, the, with initiatives such as the ASEAN University Network, but also programs supported by the European Union, such as the SHARE program, um, which looks into ways to provide more scholarship for student mobility within ASEAN, but also um, with, with Europe to help with um, visa harmonization, so on and so forth. So really, um, I'd like to, to set the picture uh, as comprehensive as possible and to address migration from the perspective of labor migration, um, skilled, highly skilled and lower skilled migration, rights of migrants um, and, and student mobility. Um, Looking on the other side, so uh, on the Europe uh, side, uh, in contrast to, to ASEAN, we uh, in across Europe, we have the free movement of workers um, as the funding uh, principles of the European Single Market um, Act. And, for, uh, and later on in 1992, with the full free movement of people across Europe. Uh, that means that EU migrant workers and their families uh, benefit from the same uh, social rights uh, and similar advantages as nationals of the host state. Um, so it's it's really uh, achieving the the free movement of of people. So initiatives. Um, that that allow uh, migration of skilled lower skilled uh, labor migration across across the EU. Another important step that I would like to mention is the 85 Schengen Agreement with the abolition of controls of the internal borders. So even more. Um, uh, opportunities and easier ways for uh, people mobility across the EU. Now, in addition to internal mobility within the EU, we also talk about external mobility. So EU plus countries, plus external uh, countries outside the European Union. And most of the uh, labor mobility there is linked to trade, as in as, as I've just presented before for ASEAN. So the same uh, principle applies in all, almost all free trade agreements concluded by the EU with the third countries. We have, um, we have uh, regulations on labor mobility linked to trade in services. And on top of that, for lower skill migration, we have um, a set of bilateral agreements and also the seasonal workers directives uh, directive, which looks into ways to protect the rights of, of um, migrant workers that come to the EU. Now, on the side on, on, on mobility, so students across the EU enjoy um, a wide range of um, 
of, of benefits and rights in terms of mobility. And I would just like to point out the Erasmus Plus program, which looks into the, which, which facilitates, which enables mobility in the higher education sector. And as I said, it also has this external dimension, uh, looking into ways to attract uh, uh, mobility in the higher education sector from uh, other countries from external countries, including Asia, the ASEAN partners. Now, let me move on and uh, highlight the main instruments of cooperation between Asia and Europe. And yes, we have the, and, and link this with my discussion on, on uh, human mobility, labor mobility in particular. And here we have, yes, the Asia-Europe um, meeting. And uh, for, for more than 10 years now, we have the so-called ASEM conference of the directors general of, of immigration and um, management of migration flows that look in mainly on security aspects linked to migration. So border uh, control, uh, preventing irregular migration, but also the dimension on the rights of a migrant Migrants and uh, student mobility with the ASEAN Ministries of Employment and Labor, where in parallel discussions are taking place on how to further go on with the agenda on incorporating more rights for um, uh, migrant workers and their families, and also the role played by the Asia Europe Foundation to bring in a venue, a space where discussion, informal cooperation between Europe and uh, Asia can take place uh, to discuss best practices on uh, mobility, um, labor mobility, student mobility. Um, then in, in relation to uh, the security dimension of, of migration, we also have in place the so-called EU ASEAN migration and border management programs one and two. Too, with also with the support with the, from the Interpol, which again looks into these um, ways of tackling irregular migration, anti-trafficking measures, so exchanges of best practices. If I move further on, on the dimension of the rights of uh, migrants and uh, labor mobility, more generally to student mobility, again, we have instruments of cooperation as, for instance, the EU ASEAN dialogue instrument, the RADI instrument, and the enhanced regional uh, um, instrument, the E, the so-called e RADI, which looks into the ASEAN EU plan of action uh, since 2016. Uh, until 2024, where these issues are really um, addressed with so this more holistic dimension on economic migration rights, social dimension, um, and, and student mobility. And linked to student mobility, I mentioned previously, so the EU has been uh, supporting ASEAN states to uh, help with harmonization of the higher ed education uh, space across, across ASEAN. Um, in providing uh, um, support with recognition of qualification, for instance, part of the so-called SHARE um, program uh, type of cooperation. Now, having presented the key formal and informal modes of cooperation on, on migration. Let me link this discussion to digital transformation in Asia and Europe and uh, highlight what are the implications for labor migration, mobility, human mobility um, in general. And we have both on the um, Asian or, or ASEAN regional framework and within the EU, a lot of developments when it comes to digitalization, digital uh, single market in the EU uh, and in ASEAN, part of the ASEAN um, Economic Community Blueprint, the Master Plan on ASEAN um, Connectivity, the E-ASEAN Framework Agreement, the discussion around the digital ASEAN, supported also by the World Economic uh, Forum. And as of 2018, the discussion is being linked more and more to labor migration. So within the ASEAN Forum on, on uh, Labor Migration, um, we have the 
uh, uh, we have a, a place, a forum to address digitalization, to promote decent work for micro, migrant workers across ASEAN. And the topics addressed here really refer to how we could benefit from digitization in terms of labor migration management, enhancing digital skills for the ASEAN workforce, uh, and providing digital services for uh, migrants. A very similar picture we have in Europe within the EU with the digital single market um, and the um, additional reforms that um, maybe uh, accentuated during the COVID when most of the um, commerce uh, moved to online modus of operandi. And, and so part of this whole movement when it comes to um, the workforce migration, again, the, the objective is to invest really in digital skills development across the EU, um, use digital technologies for, for student mobility, validation of skills, um, anticipating uh, carrying out analysis of, of skill needs across, um, across uh, the EU um, market, yes, labor market. Um, and I would just maybe point out one recent uh, development um, as the so-called Una Europa Forum of, um, uh, of an alliance of 11 universities at the moment, mainly from the EU member states, but also outside from Switzerland, as for instance, the University of Zurich has recently um, uh, joined the alliance where they, they perceive the higher education space as a, as a free space of, of mobility of students, of, of academics, and they use technology as, for instance, blockchain to record the um, academic credentials of students, um, the ideas of personal um, information. So a, a pilot study has been concluded already. And so there is a lot really going on on digitalization and how this can enhance uh, labor and student mobility. All right, and I'll come to, to the end of my presentation by highlighting uh, some of the opportunities that are brought about by digitization for uh, the mobility of, of labor, but also addressing some of the challenges associated with this. And finally, I'd like to conclude on some points uh, for future collaboration between the two regions. So now um, on the opportunities side, um, I think development of application, digital platforms of, to spread information for migrant workers where they can access uh, um, relevant information on where they could uh, find uh, a suitable um, employment in, a, in another country could be one dimension. Then for remittances or sending money back home, so using digital tools, also blockchain as a technology for, for sending remittances in um, home countries. Um, digital platforms for the management of um, documents, storage of personal information, health uh, data, for instance. Um, also, digital services for providing legal support or online training opportunities, welfare assistance for migrants could be um, could be uh, envisaged. Um, platforms to exchange information among uh, migrants themselves could also take, uh, could, could also help uh, with, with migration of labor. Um, for instance, also online complaint services for migrants. So there are many issue areas where digitization could help uh, better manage migration, help the migrants themselves uh, find suitable working condition, have the tools um, to uh, know their rights and to file complaints if necessary, use technology to securely send back money uh, whenever needed. Now, on the other side, there is um, there are also a set of challenges 
uh, associated with these developments. And I think the most one of the most important is the addressing the gaps in terms of the digital skills, the access to information and affordable technical devices. So how this is this is really a big a big challenge in how migrants can develop their digital skills, access the infrastructure and use uh, technical devices, computers, smartphone, and so forth. Another very important um, point to consider on the challenges side is the spread of misinformation via digital platforms and networks. So how do we ensure uh, that we, we protect migrants uh, from falling into all sorts of traps? Um, also, data protection regulations need to be in force uh, to, to protect uh, personal uh, data. And maybe not least, digitization also brings along um, uh, um, changes in the labor force, in the, the market structure, which some of the traditional jobs might be replaced by automatization and therefore can be perceived as a challenge for, uh, for labor mobility. Now, to conclude, um, where, where I would see the discussion going further between Europe, Asia, EU, ASEAN, perhaps in the context of the ASEM as a, as a forum, as a, uh, as a venue to, to take this holistic approach to labor migration, um, mobility of people, of, of students. I think efforts should really continue on sharing knowledge, best practices and strategies for a digital-based workplace. So um, how we ensure that we can uh, evenly um, uh distribute digital skills programs encouraging training or risk uh, skilling whenever necessary uh, and subsequently and related to that is how can we revise labor laws and regulations so that they reflect the transformations brought about by the digital economy and address the the challenges, some of them that I've just mentioned uh, before in terms of data protection, access to infrastructure. So really uh, sharing good practices, uh, policies that work in the EU, in, in the ASEAN, and see how we can build on that for the benefit of the society as a whole, uh, I believe is the, uh, would be the, the further step of the, um, Europe, Asia collaboration um, along this topic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Flavia. That was a very, very comprehensive presentation uh, on the structural aspects of cooperation between Asia and Europe, and more particularly between EU and ASEAN. Um, we have uh, several questions, of course, uh, that we would love to ask you, but perhaps at the uh, after all the speakers have uh, finished uh, speaking. So uh, after Flavia, it is my uh, great uh, uh, pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Emmanuel C. Lalan. He is the chief executive of Idea Corp, an independent nonprofit organization in the Philippines, and he works on ICT for development issues particularly ICT policy development, ICT in education, and e-governance. He has uh, published several works on ICT for development, and uh, he also trains government officials from developing countries on ICT policy development issues and on e-governance and social media for development. For the 13th ASM plenary study, uh, Emmanuel wrote on building inclusive digital societies. He has also captured the, uh, the, the evolution of legislations pertaining to digital economy in the ASEAN region. So who better than Emmanuel to throw more light on today's theme, theme uh, of the webinar. Emmanuel, the floor is, to, uh, is handed over to you, please. Thank you very much, Anita. Uh, and good day to everybody. Good morning to those in Europe and good afternoon uh, for us in Asia. Uh, 
what I would like to do today is to share with you some thoughts on um, inclusive uh, digital societies. Now, I think one of the consequences, the terrible consequences of COVID pandemic has been uh, the rise in the global poverty rates. No? And uh, in fact, one of the, uh, it, is, uh, it is said that that has set back poverty reductions in developing countries by almost a decade. Um, the other challenge that uh, COVID-19 has posed in, in terms of inclusive development is that, uh, again, inequality. Uh, has has been exacerbated as a consequence of the pandemic. Uh, as pointed out by Joseph Stiglitz, it's not an equal opportunity virus. You know? it, uh, it affects the poor uh, more than uh, the rich. Now, uh, uh, certainly this sort of both poverty and inequality existed before uh, the pandemic. Uh, and so there were already issues related to these two things that had to be addressed. Uh, for instance, even in the past growing, uh, fast growing region of the Asia Pacific, uh, there are uh, high levels of in income inequality. Now, the um, most suggest, for instance, the, uh, the ADB suggests that uh, moving forward, the growth prospects are brightest in economies with widespread technology adoption, uh, resilient merchandise export, rich in natural resources. So obviously, because I work in the area of technology, I highlight the importance of technology. Uh, the UN SCAP uh, also suggested that uh, for lower income and other vulnerable groups, the following issues must, must be addressed to, in, to address uh, inequality. Uh, the availability of ICT infrastructure, skills development, access to technology and apps uh, that meet the needs of low-income groups. Now, obviously, most of this, uh, again, is based on already uh, studies that have shown that ICT has significant uh, impact on human development, particularly for lower middle income and low income countries. Uh, but there is uh, a, a big but here uh, in that uh, technology is not necessarily that destroyer of jobs that we uh, seem to associate it with, but it increases inequality bet between those with skills and those without. So a purely sort of digital development solution to growth uh, in the post-COVID uh, world uh, has the possibility of increasing inequality. So we may be solving the growth problem, but we also might be creating an inequality problem. Uh, previously, as was uh, mentioned by Anita, I addressed the digital, uh, inclusive digital development, uh, particularly in terms of the uh, uh, workers, um, data protection and data privacy, as well as uh, artificial intelligence governance. Uh, this afternoon, or today, I'd like to address uh, three uh, areas where I think um, uh, we should focus on in terms of building inclusive uh, digital societies. So the first is financial technology or fintech. The second is digital agriculture. And the third is digital competence. Uh, so I, I will not, I offer no solutions, uh, particularly uh, in terms of how we would move forward with this, but I'd like to just kick off the discussion because I think these are three areas that is much potential by way of addressing both uh, development and inequality. So uh, most of us uh, know FinTech uh, by way of uh, it being uh, uh, using technology to uh, in uh, financial services. So I think the advantage of fintech is that it improves the quality of traditional financial institution by increasing efficiency and productivity. Uh, it reduces cost. Uh, it provides for greater convenience and speedy transactions. Uh, 
in uh, in the developing world, the prop the challenge of financial inclusion is constrained by the limited ability of financial institutions to overcome cost and risk constraints. So, in this sense, uh, fintech because it reduces transaction cost, uh, it facilitates trade uh, and other economic activities, um, is very attractive from the point of view of inclusive uh, development. So, for instance, uh, mobile phones uh, are being used for financial services uh, and has a potential really of addressing the needs of the unbanked and uh, developing countries. So, for instance, in the Philippines, the pandemic, uh, there was a chicken and egg question on mobile phone uh, uh, apps, you know, digital wallets, uh, digital cash. Before the pandemic, the challenge, uh, these, uh, the producer, the uh, sellers were saying, we didn't have enough buyers using digital cash. And the on the other side, the uh, buyers were selling, there were not enough sellers who accept digital cash. And so the pandemic quickly uh, resolved that issue. Uh, and to date, we have over 80% of adult Filipinos with digital cash applications in their mobile phones. So that is how quickly it has changed and how it has reached, I think, more people than ever before in terms of formal financial services. Uh, the other potential game changer for fintech is the platform-based learning models. Uh, now, this one, uh, particularly for small and medium enterprises. Uh, in the Philippines, we have just, uh, the government has just issued digital banking license. Uh, so uh, we will have seven digital banks. Uh, and there is a lot of excitement and interest uh, in digital banking. As a matter of fact, one of the bricks and mortal banks decided to give up their traditional banking license and get a digital banking license. So I think this uh, uh, bodes well in terms of uh, uh, financial inclusion uh, in, in the Philippines. So the director of a research institute for agriculture in Southeast Asia uh, believes that fintech could be increasing agricultural productivity because of its huge potential for financial inclusion by making financial services products accessible even to the marginalized farmers and farming families. So that's that's the promise, that's the potential of fintech. Of course, there are challenges here, and perhaps one of the biggest is uh, regulation. So the rules uh, regulating the financial sector uh, tend to be very uh, inflexible and there's a danger of stifling innovation. Uh, there's also the challenge of uh, fragmenting, uh, fragmented uh, funding like, uh, landscape for fintech companies uh, and their ability to uh, deliver technical innovation uh, in, in, in finance. Uh, the second area where I think uh, we need to think about in terms of digital inclusion is the digitalization of agriculture. Uh, again, the idea here is uh, uh, it provides technical optimization of agricultural production systems, value chains, and food systems. So uh, again, the promise is not just uh, more efficient farming, but also food security. So digitalization enhances knowledge exchange and learning using ubiquitous data and improved monitoring of crises and controversies in agricultural chains and sectors. Digital agriculture reduces poverty when smallholders farm use technology to increase efficiency, thereby becoming more competitive on the market. So there are a number of digital agriculture apps uh, Rural Advisory, e-service and e-learning, meteorological information, risk management in agriculture, insurance schemes, market information and e-commerce. Uh, I'm very excited about this, the rise of uh, digital platforms for agriculture, uh, natural resource management and productive inclusion, financial services, social protection programs, ensuring knowledge and innovation. Uh, this is just a quick uh, sort of uh, 
how, uh, for instance, in India, uh, technology is being used in uh, in agriculture. You know? So um, I will not spend a lot of time there, uh, but I would like to sort of conclude this section uh, by suggesting that really an important role of government here is to facilitate the adoption of digital technologies by the agriculture and food sectors. And also, of course, government using digital technologies to design and deliver better agricultural policies. Uh, the third area where I think uh, we can look into by way of cooperation is digital competency. Uh, the skill set that enables a person to be a responsible and productive citizen in an increasingly digital world. Uh, the uh, East uh, Europe has a digital competencies framework called DigiComp 2.2, and it defines digital competence as confident, critical, and responsible use and engagement with digital technologies for learning at work and for participation in society. It is defined as a combination of knowledge, skills, and attitudes. I'm not sure if this, if you can read this, but uh, these are the five competencies uh, in the e-competency framework, uh, Digicom. Now, the idea behind uh, Digicom uh, is that it provides a common understanding of what digital competence is, uh, and therefore provides a basis for framing digital skills policy, curricular development, and assessment of digital skills, both in the education sphere and for the labor market. So you, we still need uh, to develop specialist digital skills, uh, but I think the basis or the foundation for that uh, should be digital competence. Uh, in the Philippines, uh, we are. My organization is promoting a, uh, a Philippine digital competency framework, and the areas where we think, uh, and the areas we are proposing would be ICT proficiency, critical use, creative production, participation, digital learning and development, uh, and digital well-being. So the idea is that digital competence is not just a technical proficiency; uh, yeah, it involves ethical considerations, uh, it involves critical use and creative use. Uh, again, uh, I think government has a role to play in terms of developing and implementing uh, a national digital competency framework like Digicomp. Uh, for us, uh, at least my organization, uh, the, uh, digital literacy should be seen as a new literacy. No? So aside from reading, writing, and uh, mm -hmm. Numer uh, numeracy, I think, digital competency should be something that everybody should uh, possess and government must provide a way to define it and uh, make sure that all citizens are able to, uh, to possess those skills. So let me just end uh, with uh, why this uh, inclusive digital development is important. Uh, the technology provides us the possibility to create an inclusive world. If, however, we fail to act, uh, we will. Uh, there's the danger of making societies more polarized with deepening digital and social divides. Uh, thank you and good day. Thank you very much, uh, Emmanuel. If you will uh, leave the sharing of screen, oh. uh, then we can move ahead. Yeah. Excellent. And uh, now uh, we have our next speaker, uh, our very own uh, Irma. She is the full professor for tax governance, and she's also the PhD uh, dean at Leiden Law School in the Leiden University. She's also the EU Jean Manet uh, chair holder on the topic of EU tax governance, which is in short EU tax gov. The, and she is the lead researcher of the European Research Council ERC funded project that investigates global tax governance in short global tax gov, also uh, official co-host of uh, today's webinar. Irma's uh, areas of expertise are international tax law and comparative tax law in developed and developing countries. And more recently, uh, she has worked on exchange of information 
mm-hmm. and BEPS related issues in developing countries. IRMA covers a sensitive topic of tax governance and cooperation, which is second only in my view uh, to the regulatory cooperation of uh, uh, among technology highways in the digital economy. Uh, Irma wrote an extensive chapter on the role of uh, digital technology in tax administration and cooperation. And today we are hoping to get uh, more updates uh, from Irma on this very important topic. Irma, the floor is yours, please. Thank you so much, Anita. And thank you to Lily and the Leiden Asia Center for also helping with the co-organization. This is something that we came because it is the celebration and the anniversary of mm-hmm. AU Asia. And I think that is the time to reflect on what we have done in the ASAM study, ASAM study, but as well to present the challenges. And I'm very pleased that some of the issues that Flavia mentioned, but also the issues that Emmanuel mentioned, I'm also mentioning it today. Mm-hmm. And let me see, I will try to. So we are discussing about an Asian model of cooperation in digital economy and taxation. We have two different ways to see uh, digital economy. One is the the taxation itself of of, uh, digital services, for instance, digital platforms and so forth, but this is not the topic we are gonna discuss today. We are discussing today the challenges for the tax administration in this model of digitalization and how these challenges, what they can do together the EU and ASEAN countries to address those challenges. And the first part that we want to have is we are going to give you an institutional framework for taxation. So where we find the instruments, I promise this is not a a presentation all about taxation, but I need to tell you more or less what is the landscape, because we do have an institutional framework but we do not have like the WTO, the World Trade Organization, we do not have one set of rules and we do not have one international organization. So we have different international organizations, the discussions between the OECD, the UN, we have some uh, interna- international IMF, International Monetary Fund and World Bank that provide technical assistance and we have also some cooperation. At the same time, there is an important role, especially due to the financial crisis that the G20 decided to take the role of giving the mandate to the OECD to develop, a, for instance, in this case, a change of information among tax administrations all around the world. And since 2013, we are also talking about base erosion profit shifting by multinationals, what it means to have the multinationals pay their fair share. At the same time, we do have the supranational organization, in this case, the European Union, but we cannot forget the regional tax organizations of regional cooperation frameworks. And in this case, for instance, we have for Africa, the African Tax Administration Forum and the Inter-American Center of Tax Administrations. And for Asia specifically, we do have the ESGATAR, that is a study group, the Bell Road Initiative, BRITACOM, and Asia-Europe meeting that is inter-regional cooperation. But what you see here is that normally we do not have one set of rules And sometimes it's even difficult to figure out who is doing what and when they are doing it. And the challenges I want to introduce today to you today is the need for digital connectivity. Yes, but it also needs to develop and to create a trust and confidence in the the information and communications technology environment. And what does it mean that? We are talking about the information that we can exchange digitally but at the same time, the citizen, and in this case, the taxpayer, will need to take into, have the trust and the confidence that the data will be managed in the best possible way. And as Flavia mentioned at the beginning, data protection issues is a very important issue, actually, because even though the European Union just uh, modified the data protection regulation, so they have the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, we see that in a lot of countries, especially in non-European, non-European, Asian, Africa, and Latin American countries, we do have still following the 1995 data protection directive. What is already out of a, a context, out of date for the big data, for the data analytics and all the developments that have taken place. Because remember, the data protection directive is from 1995. And a lot of countries at that moment decided we need data protection regulations 
Therefore, we need an example, and this was the Data Protection Directive. But since a couple of years ago, we have this regulation, the General Data Protection Regulation in the European Union, but we also see that countries have not yet used that as a new model for introduced data protection rules. At the same time, from a tax administration perspective, digitalization and new technologies offer opportunities to better manage uh, compliance, to tackle non-compliance and to protect their tax base. So there is a lot of information that is being go going on. So we have a change of information, we have financial accounting information, we have uh, information or reporting of uh, what the taxes are being paid to the countries. So we do have the information. The problem is that we do not know how to use it. First of all, because the amount of information make it so difficult to still process all the information. And at the same time, there are problems in terms of the confidentiality of this information and how we protect that actually decision making now taking and based on this information, what rights we can give to the taxpayer, to the citizen. So therefore, there is, of course, the change of views and experiences between tax administration is necessary. And we see that in Britacom and Escatar, there are some exchange of uh, experiences, but focus more on what the tax administration needs in terms of digitalization. But it does not address so much the rights of the taxpayer to confidentiality, to protect the security in the information and so forth. So when we see now, this digitalization brings a lot of challenges. So first one is to update the data protection rules. Second of all, to give to the taxpayer the, the trust that there will be confidentiality and protection of privacy on the information of the data, of the data exchange, and at the same time to facilitate for tax administrations to process this data. And we see that Nowadays, we are moving from data to big data to data analytics. So it used to be that you have the data and we make a distinction between personal and business data. For instance, in personal data, we talk about not only your personal data. So what is your name? What is your social security number and so forth? But we are also talking about your genetic and biometric data. So a specific uh, features of you and you being you that will not, with the biometric information, may not be used of it's so specific on you, the genetic and biometric data. But at the same time, we have business data. So we have the data in the, for the business, so like for instance, trade business secrets, and also business uh, decisions, so business processes. And this is the kind of data that we need to protect. But nowadays, we also have big data. And big data means that actually we do have lots of information that is going to be collected. So for instance, we have what Emmanuel also mentioned about the digital payments, for instance, we have electronic invoices, we have the tax data from mass media, so back, bank, chamber of commerce and so forth, even from social media. So we know nowadays that there is so much information that the tax administration can use that information to also say to the taxpayer, actually, you need to pay this amount of taxes. Actually, your tax is being, a, what you are declaring here as about tax is not correct because look at this. In your bank statement, in your chamber of commerce, you have also this uh, amount of uh, money. So you need to also declare that. But then we also move to the data analytics and that goes to a little, a little higher level where we took not only about the data itself, the big data, but also the processing of the data. So the processing of the data by means of, for instance, artificial intelligence, use of algorithms. And here comes a big challenge because you have the tax administrations who use algorithms, but the question is what kind of, what happens if that is an algorithm decision-making? So if the tax administration says, your, this decision is based on this algorithm. Does the taxpayer in this case has an opportunity to oppose, to appeal to this decision making? And that's also a problem. And this is the way where we can also exchange views and, and ideas on how to process this data. So we are moving from data to big data to data analytics, but are the tax administrations 
are the digital compet competences within the uh, in, uh, government and institutions being also updated in this. And next to that, we also see the amount of data flows. So we look at trade, internet governance, taxation, privacy, and data protection. So we look in trade that actually we're talking about trade in digital services. So we are talking about all these online markets where is actually the, there is trade there, the online content, but also in digital services. You don't even need now to send one person to do that job. You can even send a 3D printing and say this is three, third, three the printing will help you to do that. So it's even the content itself in trade is not even the, the, the digital trade like we saw before, the digital content, but it goes further than that. We also have the internet governance, where of course there is a lot of issues, for instance, in the case of uh, Facebook and data analytics, where they use the information and they sell the information. So it's important to safeguard the security and privacy in these developments, where is the data, where is the information, and also to show that uh, the data will be protected. And of course, in taxation, we have the increased exchange of data, like I mentioned from data to big data to data analytics, but also that it has to be proportional, has to be legitimate. That means protecting also the taxpayer for a specific reason and has to protect the privacy. And at the same time, we have this big umbrella that is the privacy and the data protection. So how we make sure that we protect this personal and sensitive data and we introduce safeguards to protect this data. When we look at this, there is a need so for a balance. And this balance is, of course, we have liberalization of trade, we have data flows, we have digital services. We have seen from the previous two presentations that there is a lot of digital data at this moment. But at the same time, the problem is how we make sure that we regulate this and how we make sure that we protect the information, how we make sure that we protect the privacy. And that is very difficult because when I mentioned to you in this institutional framework of taxation, we do not have a specific instrument that protects all data. We do have, and I mentioned in the chapter, the, the Convention of the Council of Europe on the Automatic Processing of uh, uh, Personal Data, including big data, that has been opened for a, by means of a protocol to non-European uh, Council of Europe countries, but only six countries have signed this, this, this convention. So we are still talking about how limited it is because it's only for the Council of Europe and six countries, and some countries are even waiting to ratify that. So when you look at the, the chapter, an invitation is to read the chapter. So this is kind of giving you the ideas. This is the only instrument that we have. So we need to do more. At the same time, when we look at this balance, the balance, it has to be, we promote the data flows, but we also protect the personal and business data. So we need to make sure that there are rules to uh, promote transparency and compliance. So how do I use the data? Also, the use of a uh, blockchain. So how we connect this data. And you see that also in the previous presentations, we mentioned about blockchain and the change of data. And at the same time, to make sure that there is not, a, 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 there are cybersecurity issue, a, a safeguards where it prevents from hackers, for instance, to use that data. And we know nowadays that it is almost every month where we see there is information that's being leaked there is all this information from these clients. There is all this information. So there is a lot of leak and hackers being using this um, information. And at the same time, the challenge is also for countries to update their data protection rules. And for this, they need to look at the general uh, and the general data protection regulation because it is the only instrument at this moment that provides some um, possibilities, some measures to update this, uh, this data protection rules. So finally, to discuss this, we need to discuss this protection of personal data in the era of digital trade. So we need to establish international rules in data flow. And I think that in this case, the cooperation between AU and ASEAN is a very good example where these international rules in data flow we see in labor mobility. We also see inclusive societies. We see it in digital agriculture. 
But at the same time, we need to regulate the information sharing and automatic processing of personal data. And for this is what I mentioned to you, the Council of Europe Convention on Automatic Processing of Personal Data. We need to also be able to protect the privacy and personal data on the internet and online media, what is also very difficult right now. We need to improve the user protection and security in cyberspace. And we also need to create this balance between, of course, there is access to data. Of course, there is freedom of information. But to what extent this data can be used without affecting your privacy? And this is something that the balance that we, we need to take into account because we are in this digital connectivity world where we really have to think about this and we really have, and I think at ASEAN and this study and has made possible that we think about all topics that in, include this digital society. And with this, I will finish my presentation. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Irma. Uh, very illuminating. But uh, again, uh, we have uh, some very uh, uh, concerned uh, issues on data protection and the role of governments actually. So perhaps we'll come to you later on that. But for now, uh, I have the great honor to invite my esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Lurong Chen. Uh, Lurong is a senior economist in area. He has submitted a very brief bio uh, uh, to this uh, webinar and uh, he does the same to other international panels also. But his bio belies his extensive knowledge and writings on digital economy in Asia and the role of digital economy in international trade and also the structural gaps that uh, are there uh, between developed and developing parts of the world insofar as um, participation in the GVC of uh, digital economy is concerned. Uh, Lurong's uh, research interests include digital economy, Asian regionalism, GVCs, as I mentioned, uh, trade in services and IPRs. He also works extensively on FTAs, uh, on the Chinese economy per se, and the RCEP, and uh, of recently he worked extensively on RCEP negotiations. Before joining area, uh, uh, Lurong was a research fellow at the United Nations um, University. But as of now, Lurong is our lead expert on all things uh, considered important in digital economy. Lurong, the floor is yours, please. And thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Anita, for a very nice introduction. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my great pleasure to join today's uh, uh, webinar on Asia-Europe cooperation on inclusive digital societies. So, uh, so when thinking about how Asia-Europe cooperation could unlock the potential of development and enable and enable countries in two regions to harness the digital economy, uh, we see one of the very fundamental topic is how to further improve the connection between Asia and Europe. So uh, that's where we come, we get this topic connectivity from. Um, connectivity is certainly not a brand new topic. It has been um, already, uh, uh, widely discussed in policy, uh, academia, and also uh, in business as well. However, uh, te technology progress and changing uh, global economy and geopolitics keep introducing new contents and challenges to uh, connectivity. And here we see promoting, uh, and here we see uh, promoting digitalization as a top priority in the drive to promote connectivity and cooperation between uh, Asia and Europe. Um, we believe that for all countries, this could create opportunities to realize the potential of substantive growth, um, and mainly by taking collect, uh, collaborative actions to improve digital connectivity uh, accelerate digital transformation and also uh, facilitate uh, online business. Um, regarding digital connectivity, there are many areas of possible collaboration between Asia and Europe. 
such as uh, uh, promoting digital related infrastructure in both the physical and the cyberspace, um, harmonizing rules and regulations to ensure fair competition on online marketplaces, as uh, many speakers already mentioned, and also improving connectivity de de derived services to generate more value added so country can benefit uh, more from this cooperation. And also areas such as strengthening government government to government uh, partnership, as well as that of private sector cooperation and public private partnerships. So there are many um, areas that worth exploring here. Um, but the focus of uh, today's uh, uh, speech will be about data connectivity. Um, as we know, data connectivity will require infrastructure building, both in the hardware part, such as ICT infrastructure and logistics, and also the software part, which will include services and regulations that will facilitate the flow of data, capital, goods and services, and also people. And as for Asia Europe data connectivity, there are some obstacles stem from the existence of developing gaps, as uh, we already know, both across different countries, but also within the same countries, but between the metropolitan area and the remote rural area. So this kind of in, in, in develop inequality, we need to always bear in mind, especially if uh, in developing countries, uh, it is not unusual that the development of data related in infrastructure got impacted by the lack of capital, human skills, and technology know how. But an uh, even greater challenge here is how to reach an international consensus to realize um, free flow of data with trust. And this is very much relevant to what. Professor Emma just talked about without this free flow of data, how we how we can handle with this international taxation on a digital uh, economy. So here uh, we believe that free flow of data uh, has two meanings. On the one hand, free means data are able to flow as freely as desired in terms of speed, form, designation, and so on. And as we know, with the development of ICT technological barriers to data flow have been effectively reduced, especially by the widespread use of a smartphone, 4G and, and 5G network. And this is also supported by the technology advances in data collection, processing, storage, and distribution. Yeah. And on the other hand, trust highlights the increasing concern about um, data accuracy, and, and safety and also uh, privacy protection. Uh, here we see ICT development as a two-edged sword. On the one hand, certainly it facilitates the flow of data, but on the other hand, it will also increase the vulnerability of data to be leaked, stolen, or misused. So, um, so here we see the policy intervention uh, could be of help to balance the data's free flow and privacy protection. And in this, in this regard, I think Asia-Europe meeting could contribute to build a consensus that provide for the free flow of data, uh, at least across borders among member states, and while but at the same time also address reasonable privacy and security concerns. Uh, However, international rule settings on data flow is sort of a uh, delicate, I would say that. On the one hand, we don't want over-regulation, for example, making play with the security issues, national security issues, because this may discourage data flows and hinder the growth of the digital economy. But on the other hand, we also don't want under-regulation, uh, for example, not paying enough attention to cyber threats or, or, or the consumer rights, as this may also hurt the long-term market dynamics or even lead to kind of, we call it online gray zones, which we don't, we don't want to see. Uh, in practice, um, for the market to accept and adopt the new game rules in business, uh, 
we yeah so in 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 practice we would like to have a, a policy framework that can uh, build on the logic of economic justific justification this is uh, this is the way to persuade the market to adopt those uh, rules and regulation and then support the development of the digital economy so in 2019 actually uh, my colleagues and myself we proposed a policy framework um, to the g20 and t20 meeting where we highlight five categories of backup policy to support free flow of data with trust and here i would like to briefly uh, reintroduce this framework so the first category include uh, policies that promote economic liberalization and trade facilitation so we are talking about digital economy but actually digital economy is uh, consists of both the physical world and also the cyberspace actions uh, such as uh, accepting e-signatures and e-authorization those trade facilitation measures can actually uh, have an impact on the development of um, digital economy and therefore will generate we call the feedback effects on promoting free flow of data with trust. So the more trade we have, the closer relation we have, the easier to build trust and then the easier to facilitate the, 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 the free flow of data. The second category includes policies to correct or mitigate market failures resulting from features of the data-driven economy, um, like the network uh, externality, economy of scales, information uh, asymmetry, or any combination of these conditions. And policy relate under these categories are typically linked to competition, consumer protection, uh, and also um, intellectual property rights protection, IPR protection. And the third, it will be necessary to reconcile policies with social values and economic efficiency. We need a substantive, coordinated institutional effort to, to establish international norms and harmonize individual approaches. Otherwise, um, uh, countries with different regulatory regimes may, may risk creating a segmented digital world. This is something uh, we, would, we don't want to see, I, I believe. And the four category includes policies that aim to uh, accommodate data flows and data related business in the national policy regime. Um, the reason we highlight this is that the, the primary concern of such policy is how to incorporate new digital technologies, business models and services into the regulatory system. And this will require actions to deal with uh, controversial issues such as um, taxation, just as uh, uh, Emma mentioned, let ensure fair treatment of online and offline business as well as domestic and international uh, market players the fifth one the fifth category will include the protective measures for data flows uh, similar to those for the protection of infant industries um, we know that digital economy is a full of potential and countries want to benefit from the competitive advantage and social benefits generated by those new data related business and it's very natural that country one especially developing countries wish to nurture their own industry with national strategic policies in this regard the global regulatory system must include some flexibility as long as the related straight uh, as long uh, as long as those um, uh, strategic policies are economically justified. And this is a, a condition in favor of developing country to catch up. So um, this is uh, the five part of uh, our policy framework. And this has already been well received by the G20 leaders and also the T20 participants. And we think this is very much re relevant to the uh, Asia Europe uh, digital connectivities. And for that region, we suggest that the Asia, the Asia Europe um, collaboration on digital connect, connectivity to end for a, a, a pan Asia Europe framework of data governance, uh, on, on data governance consensus 
they were they can be widely accepted by member states and will be able to use as a shared reference by um, each digital policy regimes. So um, with this uh, to quick to quickly sum up, um, we see data connectivity um, will have a, a broader effect on the digital economy. And in addition to efforts to deepen market integration and interregional cooperation, um, there's still space uh, to develop an Asia-Europe uh, policy guideline uh, um, and probably also a mechanism to improve um, regulation harmonization and cross-border service, li service liberalization between Asia and Europe. And those joint policy efforts will effectively facilitate um, online business and therefore promote the development of the digital economy. Um, but of course, uh, achieving uh, this kind of pan-Asia Europe interoperability of uh, rules and regulation um, could be a, a, a policy uh, challenge. And given this, um, even this is a group that covering more than 50 countries. Um, we, we, we think that enhancing Asia-Europe cooperation could, could be critical to avoid so-called spaghetti ball of kind of regulatory problems that could uh, result from bilateral approaches. So it's better that um, country um, uh, discuss these topics and come to some sort of consensus in a, in a bigger platforms like uh, Asia Europe uh, uh, meeting. So um, with this, I think I will just stop here. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lurong. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And I'm very happy that you raised the G20 issue. Indonesia has just concluded its uh, G20 leadership and it is now moved to India, two very important economies of developing Asia. So we'll come back to that, uh, Lurong, uh, in a while. Um, now uh, we have about, about 35 minutes for question and answers. Uh, I would like to request our participants, if they have not put their questions already uh, in the chat box, if they would uh, quickly do it now. And I want to go back again to Flavia because there is a lot of now the mobility of the workers. So you have to work digitally. And at the European uh, Commission, at the European Union, there is also the discussion how these e-workers will uh, deal with the, all the challenges that they have right now, not in term, only in terms of taxation, but also accessibility. How does it work? So have you uh, given some thought to, to it, uh, Flavia? Yes, um, thanks, thanks very much, Irma. Yes, it's, it's a really important question and, and a really big, <laughs> a big one. Um, I think, yes, there's, there's a lot of, of challenges uh, ahead on how to, how to deal that, how to harmonize, if we can, if we can speak about that. And I think um, uh, the, the so, so definitely, we need to have a regulatory framework in place that works for for everyone. And I think one way to go about it is to uh, include, so to have as many representatives from the uh, migrant workers, representatives, uh, Ministry of Labor, Ministry of Finance, uh, across the EU member states, come together and 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 work on a on a common framework really so we have be as representative as possible as inclusive as possible in order to accommodate such diverse uh, interests across different type of um, migrants e migrants uh, and and address all all the necessary issues uh, uh, there i have to admit i do not know of this of um, specific uh, ongoing um, already formal uh, uh, discussions around this, but it's definitely one one area that I I think needs to be uh, addressed at the EU EU level and then also on the on the ASEAN on the Asian uh, side as well. Definitely yes. 
since Flavia uh, has the floor uh, okay. at this moment, yeah. it, uh, it might I might as well uh, ask the question. So uh, Flavia, um, uh, so far we have looked at mobility of labor uh, strictly under the trade in services. Uh, I mean, and we are not talking about people to people connectivity, the tourism et cetera, aspects, etc. So uh, the rules on uh, people's movement uh, under trade and services is clearly enunciated uh, uh, with uh, WTO. However, in the case of digital economy, the place of production and the place of consumption are uh, no longer uh, specified. You know, they could be in any part of the world. And now increasingly we are in a situation of nomadic workers, uh, you know, so this has uh, implications both from an equitable uh, growth uh, perspective, uh, including the regulatory perspective. Um, we just want a very short answer from you. What What is your thought on this? That's all. <laughs> it's really broad <laughs> issue. Thanks a lot, Adita. Yes, indeed. Okay. It's, um, I think, you know, as I said, there are so many opportunities linked to, to, to digital economies, the mobility of nomad workers. We have uh, now work, we, we can work remotely from anywhere, basically, in in any jurisdiction mm. for, for any company. Mm. So, mm. so really, this, this is a huge opportunity, I think, for mm. everyone to be a part of it. But at the same time, it's also a challenge on how uh, you deal with the regulatory part, with data protection, as we said. I think this is one of the most important parts, how we ensure that data protection is in place, that we have this uh, uh, regulatory framework work for everyone across the world, really, at this at this point. So my, my, uh, my points here would be really on the regulations that... that work for for everyone and here we we need further cooperation between the eu and asia in this uh, specific context um and then uh, and then also how we we make sure that the the workforce is up to date is informed knows what what their uh, rights what their options what their what their uh, possibilities the benefits are so so channels of communication avoid misinformation uh, really this in 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 this direction i think there's still a lot of work to be done but with promising with really promising outcomes i, I would i would say and also i i invite the other colleagues if uh, they want to to add to that because i think in throughout the discussions and the presentations uh, today we we addressed uh, many of these uh, really important topics. Uh, Tofi uh, Hassan has uh, raised his hand. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks to all the speakers. It has been very interesting uh, so far because uh, actually I'm very interested on this uh, digital aspect of where governance is moving and then especially on the taxation part. So uh, this was actually very funny because yesterday I had a class of AI and governance and we were talking about this exact issue uh, that in taxation, there really is no governing body. All uh, the rules have to either be bilateral or multilateral. So as Ms. Uh, Ms. Mascara rightly mentioned, there's currently no governing body like the WTO in regard to international taxation. So the issue that arises is that in uh, EU regulation, such as uh, the AI Act, it will not always directly affect the actual tax administration. That means that each national tax administration will have its own level of transparency in regard to algorithmic decision making. So uh, this question, and then especially also to Ms. Mosquera, where do you think lies the most potential to create an international framework which, which addresses this exact, uh, actual issue? Okay, so... I will, um, I, I think that that's, that's the most important issue and that's the reason why I wanted to explain the institutional framework because we do not have one specific uh, organization instrument. And I think that the fact that there is only the Council of Europe Convention on Automatic Processing of Personal Data that has been updated for big data is the only instrument that we can think of, but I don't think that the countries know about it. So the fact that not so many countries outside the Council of Europe 
have ratified this automatic uh, this uh, international convention make it difficult so i think that i'm very much looking forward to discuss and to the eu and asian countries to this perhaps to discuss a kind of a framework where we can discuss and say these are the the issues that we need to address in in uh, in taxation because when you look at the tax administrations and you look at the reports from the asian development bank and the reports also economic outlook from the OECD for ASEAN countries, there is also not so, not, not so much to be said. So data protection seems like something different, confidentiality, algorithm, artific artificial intelligence. So we just focus on cooperation, but what does it mean this cooperation? Hmm. So a level of tax administrations, it is possible, but I think that we still need a framework. Thank you hmm. so much for the question. Yeah. And uh, I will just add to what Irma has said. Uh, if I uh, although uh, EU's uh, efforts are very well noted, as you described in your presentation, uh, Irma, uh, I suppose uh, on taxation, the G20 has been able to create a consensus in the uh, in the Saudi uh, uh, in the Saudi. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, in the Italian uh, uh, chairmanship, um, but. Uh, Fortunately, yes, it's a consensus. Uh, it's been after a lot of hard work done by OECD so uh, and its uh, committee on uh, uh, G20 committee on taxation, but it still retains the uh, what you say is the G20 way of working, uh, the G20 key principles on taxation, cooperation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it only provides you a framework. So typically it is only, uh, I would say, the first step towards international cooperation. The good news is that a lot of intellectual and academic work and the framework material, which has been brought to the table in G20 is part of the efforts of several years of work that was done uh, uh, inside the OECD and its uh, member countries. So, uh, yes, there are multilateral efforts uh, going on, but uh, sure enough, they are not responding to the immediacy of the need that is there, especially considering that technology is advancing in leaps and bounds. And Irma has written extensively on the role of technology in tax administration and how it can be effectively uh, uh, garnered uh, for this purpose, uh, for this cooperation purpose. But yeah, there is some success in G20, but how far countries, members are able to take it forward uh, remains, um, I mean, my guess remains as good, unless someone is better informed than me here. Please, Irma, you, you I, are working on it. I am dying to tell you because actually it, this is going to be more interesting than ever because actually the, last week there was a resolution from the UN UN resolution where they say okay. that actually it should not be the OECD and the G20, the one who deals with issues of international taxation, but it should okay. be the UN. So they are now discussing in the December meeting a framework. And that okay. means that the reason why they are doing that is because mm. there was no agreement on the taxation of the digital economy and the minimum tax. Mm. Especially the digital economy, they say, well, this is only for a, a, the benefit of developed countries. Mm. So this cannot be a more interesting time than mm. to discuss about governance, mm. the role of the OECD and G20 being challenged right now. Mm -hmm. So it is very interesting to see, but I do not think that yeah. it will be more taxing the taxation of the digital economy, so the big mm. uh, tech companies, but mm. it will not be about confidentiality, it will not be mm. about safeguarding, mm. it will not be about privacy, it will mm. not be about digital tax administrations. But mm. uh, we need to see what is going to happen in the UN in, in the meeting of December of the UN. Hmm. Very interesting update, uh, Irma. Very interesting. <laughs> um, we will take that news with an absolute wallop of uh, salt and watch how things proceed from here. Um, thank you. So, uh, do we have any more questions from audience, Lily? Would you have something to ask? This is not so much a question as an observation. I'm a complete um, newcomer to this field. We've done a lot about digital Silk Road, digital governance, China's role, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but I was first struck by the in-depth knowledge displayed by our uh, uh, our speakers here, um, and especially, um, of course, the 
obstacles that you see when you have to come to regulation and governance um, for this new digital economy and everything that comes with it. Um, I, however, would like to focus on something that you probably all have been looking at, but it's new for me, is the inclusiveness aspect of it all. Mm -hmm. Um, um, Emmanuel cited Joseph Stiglitz that the COVID was a highly unequal uh, virus, and it's true, but it's not only true in the comparison of the global south and the rest of the world or what have you, but even in a small country as the Netherlands, when the schools had to close down, um, it exposed that many families in the Netherlands, and the Netherlands is ranking highly in the inclusive uh, digital inclusive index did not have access to internet uh, or lacked the skills of being able to go online for education. Now, if that happens in the Netherlands, it's probably the same in huge countries like Indonesia and India. So I'm wondering um, how do we, if we can do all the regulations and we can talk government to government and in the international organizations, but how could we use ASEM in a role to um, make the inclusiveness greater at the user's end, because in the end you can have all kinds of regulations, but if people lack the means or the skills or the access to internet or computers, where are you with your inclusiveness? So I wonder, since this is a common problem, both in Asia, Europe, and the rest of the world, if ASEM could deal with that uh, that aspect also, because I, um, I'm a practitioner, I'm not a researcher, and again, I'm very much impressed by all the research that is collected, but how in the end do we reach out to the billions of people who simply have no access to internet or cannot afford a laptop or a computer? Hmm. Very interesting point made, Lily. Um... Uh, may I uh, may I uh, um, reply uh, to your observations and anybody else who would like to, uh, Lily, um, you will recall the 12th ASM summit, which was held in Brussels, and uh, the ASM Pathfinders group on connectivity, which had met several rounds uh, before the Brussels summit, only on the topic of defining ASM connectivity and the tangible areas for uh, cooperation uh, in the field of uh, connectivity. Now they had five focus areas and the fourth one was the future connectivity and digital economy. And I'm very sad to say that APGC was set up after too much uh, uh, you know, a celebration in Mongolia when ASM had uh, uh, completed its uh, 25 years. And in the vision document of moving ahead, the APGC was set up. And the report of the APGC uh, itself uh, uh, spoke about future connectivity and digital economy. But APGC completely failed to see what a digital economy connectivity should look like uh, in the framework of ASIM process, that is to say, uh, in the next few years leave aside uh, next few months, because this is an area where developments are taking place by leaps and bounds. Mm -hmm. So the only things mentioned in the future connectivity and digital economy is uh, uh, addressing the future challenges concerning uh, rapid digitalization of the economy, uh, fourth industrial revolution, uh, uh, necessary uh, regulatory uh, frameworks, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Cross-border e-commerce and MSMEs were also mentioned, but exactly what sort of facilitative work uh, 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 under digital connectivity ASM would be doing, nothing of that sort was uh, mentioned. So in my opinion, uh, Lily, uh, ASM uh, missed a very, very important chance mm -hmm. uh, to address this whole area of uh, cooperation which also happens to be the future of cooperation among any two countries and uh, multilateral uh, platforms uh, also. So that is my uh, thought on the ASIM process. But however, um, uh, if anybody else would like to comment anything more uh, from an ASIM perspective, 
I'm very happy to hear them. Uh, really would be very yes. happy. Can I, uh, can I uh, share my thoughts on this? Uh, yes, Emmanuel. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not fam very familiar with the ASEM process, right? But I think there are areas where we really could do a lot of um, knowledge exchange, uh, sharing of best practices. Uh, for instance, in digital finance, I think uh, that is an area where, uh, you know, we could learn from each other, particularly about regulation. So I think uh, digital finance is moving ahead faster in Europe than in Asia. And so there might be lessons there uh, that in Asia that we could learn from Europe. Uh, the other area where I pointed to digital competency. Uh, again, I think this is a fairly well uh, established practice in Europe but not so much in, in Asia. Uh, and so again, the, there are uh, best practices uh, that could be shared. Uh, and again, from the point of view of both policy and regulation. So I think uh, it, it, we may have to go because I think most of the, the a lot of uh, maybe uh, is a better way, uh, focus on the physical connectivity side. Uh, and not so much on the application side, which means the the real, uh, you know, the, the app that citizens could use so that their lives could change. Obviously, there is a infrastructure a prerequisite to that. But I think we have to address this both from the demand and the supply side. Uh, and we have to start discussing about what are those apps that would really matter uh, that would directly address the needs of uh uh, the poor, the marginalized, uh, uh, and those who are not part of the mainstream. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Emmanuel. Um, uh, Lily, uh, I know this topic is very uh, wide, uh, but uh, nevertheless, I hope we were able to bring forth at least some of our concerns. Flavia, do you have something to add here? Yeah, yeah very quickly. So I think... Um, to this point, besides the role of um, authorities, of, of governments, I think it's also important to take into consideration the role of the business and multinational companies actually that operates across Europe and, and Asia and their involvement with skill development, inclusiveness of the labor force into the, uh, into the digital market and part of... Uh, corporate social responsibility plans of of uh, of companies investing in uh, offering infrastructure education in uh, with digital skills in uh, deprived areas these are also actions also supported by the UN with the UN Global Compact uh, uh, and, and uh, the role of business therein. So also, I think we need to, to think about the other relevant actors that could play a leading role in uh, creating an inclusive digital economy through the means uh, available to them along the supply chain uh, and, yes, in across different uh, skills of the of the labor force and address the needs where where necessary as they have the uh, the, the the means to do that actually so uh, a, a short uh, point from to look from more bottom up in a way approaches to inclusiveness um, in in digital societies hmm. Um, um, uh, I also have to, um, since you mentioned the businesses, uh, uh, Flavia, I also want to add one more uh, thing here. It's the retail workers who are working. Now, business typic businesses typically have the mechanisms to bear the institutional costs of um, um, uh, flow of finances across the border, uh, uh, flow of goods and services across the border. The problem really starts uh, in many of the countries. Uh, I'm from India, and I spent a lot of time last year uh, working from India uh, due to COVID. And, uh, I re I, I, and because uh, this whole nomadic way of working uh, is becoming, a, um, well, a sort of a norm now, uh, my organization was happy to let me do it. But uh, 
getting, uh, and, and I speak from a retail worker's perspective, typically people who add volume to the businesses uh, across the border. The regulatory compliance for retail workers is so high uh, in my country, and I suspect this, the same is true for many other developing countries uh, uh, in Asia, uh, including um, Africa. I'm not sure about what's the situation in America. So even getting, uh, uh, even getting a package of book publications from Indonesia, my organization into India, creates uh, several uh, compliance issues. Um, and this through official carriers like DHL, um, et cetera. I'm not even speaking of the e-commerce countries. Now this sealing of borders or semi-sealing of borders, uh, you know, is something which is very worrying uh, from a retail workers perspective. Big businesses, as you know, have the mechanisms uh, for getting. So the whole inclusiveness of participation in the value chains of digital economy gets de defeated at the border issues uh, within several uh, developing economies. By the way, this includes the transfer of uh, payments and finances. Another set of regulatory compliance follows. So <laughs> just my thought, uh, uh, Flavia, um, since you mentioned big businesses. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> it's 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 in, in a way it's it's really a complex issue with so many dimensions that we can look at it and uh, yeah, as you pointed out challenges that uh probably we some of them we did not even uh, think about yet and are still still to come and so yeah, a lot of a lot of work ahead mm. absolutely. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, so typically the big businesses have thin borders, but retail businesses and retail workers have thick borders insofar as participation in digital economy is concerned. But anyway, uh, I, I leave it for what it is worth there. So friends, we are almost at the end of today's webinar. Flavia, Emmanuel, Luron, Irma, of course, one of the co-hosts. We are so grateful you could join us today here. This webinar, we decided just on the go, but Lily gave it a direction in a particular uh, inclusive uh, 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 direction. Um, and with Irma's vast knowledge on governance of uh, uh, digital economy, we were able to put together four very, very interesting presentations and an equally illuminating question and uh, answer. And I agree with you, uh, uh, Irma and Lily, that uh, governance of uh, digital uh, societies or digital economy would be the next greatest challenge um, uh, ahead of us. The technology is far advanced than the governance aspect of uh, digital economy. So the catch up uh, seems to be an uphill task. So perhaps that is where our next level of cooperation from an Asia-Europe cooperation perspective lies. Uh, Lily, Irma, Flavia, uh, Emmanuel, Lurong. Thank you again very much. And most importantly, thank you participants for joining in uh, today and uh, uh, hearing us out uh, on this very important theme. And uh, we hope that we'll be able to do a review uh, webinar sometime soon and take a stock take as we move forward. Lily, Irma, with your permission, uh, I would like to close today's uh, webinar. But thank not before so we thank you for the moderation, Anita. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Lily. So friends, officially the webinar is closed now. We can leave the room now. Mm -hmm.